Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, I'm Leah Owen, I'm one of the residents and I'll be presenting Grain Rounds this morning. And um, the first topic I have is a patient presentation, a woman who came in and was certain she had a brain tumor. And thankfully she did not, but she did have optic disc edema and uh, pressure elevation. So she was a 55 year old woman. Uh, she complained of acute onset, right sided, strong headache. She had spots in her vision um, unilaterally on that right side as well. She felt like she was looking through a nylon veil and um, this occurred approximately six days actually before she presented to us. She did not seek treatment during that time. This was associated with injection of the right eye. There was some photophobia and associated discomfort, but no pain specifically with eye movement. The um, spots and the veil somewhat cleared after the first couple of days, but uh, she had a reappearance or what she felt to be a reappearance of this uh, cloudy vision, but now in the upper visual field, again in, in her right eye. And this was just a um, 24 to 48 hours prior to her presentation to us, so longer in the course. Uh, she denied any trauma preceding these uh, symptoms. She denied any history of migraine headache recently or remotely, any flashing lights, floaters. Uh, additional history, she did not take any medications. She doesn't have any significant allergies. She doesn't have uh, any ocular pathology in her family, nor a history of migraine headaches in the family. Her father did have some sort of a brain tumor, which I think prompted her concern. Uh, she was a healthy woman. She had low blood pressure, but didn't have things like sleep apnea, anemia, autoimmune conditions, any migraine headaches. She occasionally used alcohol, but really didn't have any other pertinent social history. She was myopic, um, mildly myopic, but no other significant ocular history with surgery trauma, no history of infection, uh, her, her paddock or otherwise. Uh, her review of systems was largely negative, so she had no uh, dog claudication, scalp tenderness, fatigue, weight loss, no uh, subjective neurologic changes or fluctuations in her weight. When we examined her at presentation, which again was six days after her initial onset of symptoms, her best corrected vision was 2025 in the affected right eye and 2020 in her left eye. She did have a 0.3 log APD in her right eye associated with some uh, mild red desaturation in that eye. Her pressure was elevated in the right eye, 36 versus 18 in her unaffected eye. Her visual fields were grossly full by confrontation as were her um, movements and they were painless. She also had no neurologic deficits on examination by Dr. Katz. <laughs> uh, slit lamp examination demonstrated um, normal findings uh, of her lids and lashes. Her conjunctiva was really fairly normal. I didn't see a lot of injection at, at this point in her presentation, but her cornea did show some very mild edema um, and scant stellate KP on the right side uh, and a normal appearance on the left side. Her anterior chamber demonstrated uh, mild inflammation with cell and flare on the right and a normal appearance on the left. Her iris was normal. She didn't have any signs of atrophy or transillumination defects. She did have some anterior subcapsular cataracts that were equal bilaterally. Her vitreous was quiet and she did undergo a gonioscopy and um, which is, uh, that's what that is supposed to be spelling there. And it was open to scleral spur. She didn't have any evidence of chronic inflammation, um, PAS or any other findings of angle closure. So her optic nerve on fundoscopic examination demonstrated a stage one disc edema on the right side. And uh, this was uh, marked for inferior sectoral swelling. And then her normal, her left nerve was normal in appearance, but the cup to disc ratio was very small at 0.1. Her macula and vessels were normal. She didn't have any evidence of vasculitis, periphery completely normal, and the vitreous again clear without any haze or, or evidence of inflammation. Uh, at presentation, she underwent visual field testing, which demonstrated a normal visual field on the left eye. But as you can see in the right eye, she had a superior defect, most notably in the nasal quadrant there. 
And, you know, you could uh, hallucinate to think that that was an enlarged blind spot as well. She wasn't as reliable with her right eye, but clearly not a normal visual field. So our assessment of this patient, she's a, an otherwise healthy 55-year-old woman. She has unilateral elevated intraocular pressure, mild anterior uh, optic disc edema, correlating with visual field changes, and a contralateral disc at risk with a small cup to disc ratio. So she essentially has two phenomenon here. She has kind of anterior inflammation and elevated pressure, but she also has some posterior findings with optic disc edema. So in thinking about the differential, I kind of separated it into those two pathologies. And thinking about the optic disc edema and what can cause that, certainly increased ICP is what this patient is worried about as she's concerned about a brain tumor. And um, that can be, though, a, the spectrum of a compressive optic neuropathy to kind of um, uh, an IIH picture, though she, at the age of 55, is not really in that demographic. Um, and certainly, you can have unilateral um, increase uh, optic disc edema in the setting of a mass, for example, with a Foster-Kennedy syndrome, but we didn't see you know, a contralateral optic nerve pallor, as you might expect in that syndrome. Uh, certainly, she, this could be a presentation of optic neuritis, that she didn't demonstrate the classic pain with extraocular movements. Her vision is still fairly good, um, and so it's not as likely. It could certainly be an ischemic optic nerve injury, either an arteritic or a non-arteritic. And as I mentioned on her review of systems, she didn't have jaw claudication, fatigue, scalp tenderness, things that we associate with an arteritic presentation. Uh, of course, it could be pseudoedema, you know, drusen or an anomalous optic nerve, for example. And then other things that can generally cause a unilateral uh, optic disc edema but are not as likely in this patient are, you know, a toxic traumatic nutritional uh, insult, neuroretinitis or a um, diabetic uh, papilledema. So then thinking about her uh, other findings of anterior inflammation and increased uh, intracranial pressure, some things that come to mind would be Posner Schlafman syndrome, uh, which is characterized by both of these findings. Certainly an anterior uveitis, either an infectious or non-infectious form can, can present this way. Uh, usually you would see a little bit more in the way of uh, inflammation, but you know, you can have a spectrum and HSV can have some similar findings with scant KP, mild inflammation and increased intraocular pressure. And then finally, Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis can also present in, in a similar way, but usually you would see more prominent iris atrophy. <coughs> so based then on this differential, what we postulated to be the case in this patient is that she has Posner Schlossman syndrome accounting for elevated uh, IOP and anterior inflammation, and that this then was the cause of an ischemic optic nerve injury. And to convince you that this is a legitimate <laughs> hypothesis, I'd like to reference uh, some cases of this reported in the literature. And so um, there are two that uh, are uh, fairly good reports of this type of pathology and one that could be <laughs> consistent with that. But uh, these patients were older patients with very high presenting uh, intraocular pressures and a diagnosis of Posner Schlossman syndrome. They had, these cases had documented optic nerve edema unilaterally followed by pallor, and then they had risk factors for uh, ischemic optic nerve injury that we'll go into in a little bit more depth in a moment. Um, but, you know, a disc at risk, as the, I mentioned this patient has with a small cup to disc ratio, and then um, uh, blood flow uh, factors things that can impact blood flow to the optic nerve, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And to highlight this a little bit more, as Dr. Katz did for me, he referenced um, this particular paper, which he, I'm sure, is quite familiar with, where uh, he saw a patient with a similar presentation, um, this 41-year-old woman, very similar presentation to what we were seeing, probably a little bit more optic disc edema, 
in grade one, which is uh, the patient I'm presenting today, but this disc edema um, correlated with diffuse deficits here on her visual field. <coughs> and then at six months, re resolution of disc edema with uh, pallor, but uh, remaining visual field deficits. So in thinking about then um, the diagnosis and treatment of this patient, I thought it would be helpful to consider both entities, the Poshner-Schlossman syndrome and the ischemic optic neuropathy, as Dr. Warner here, which is a neuro-ophthalmologic condition. So um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, as we're familiar with, is infarction of the optic nerve head just posterior to the lamina cubrosa, and it's due to inadequate perfusion by the posterior ciliary arteries as pictured here. This is the lamina cubrosa with the posterior ciliary arteries, and it usually le leads to a painless monocular vision loss that can develop uh, over hours to days. And um, there are two forms of the disease. There's an arteritic form secondary to a vasculitis, and what we think of mostly is giant cell arteritis um, with the symptoms that I mentioned before, or a non-arteritic uh, form of the ischemic injury secondary to uh, inflammatory small vessel disease or poor perfusion for other reasons that we'll discuss. And this actually constitutes most of the AION um, and is most the most common cause overall for uh, optic neuropathy in patients over 50. So uh, we feel that our patient was most likely to have a non-arteritic presentation of ischemic optic neuropathy. And what are you know the risk factors for this condition? So as I mentioned, a disc at risk, a small cup to disc ratio, um, which is postulated to um, crowd the optic nerve fibers such that uh, an insult in perfusion uh, uh, causing swelling will then create additional injury because of the confined space. Uh, anemia is postulated to just be a risk factor for um, poor oxygen delivery to tissues in general, uh, importantly the optic nerve, poor perfusion pressure in the setting of coronary artery disease and diabetes, as well as hypertension, uh, and fluctuations in systemic blood pressure that we can um, uh, imagine happen during the night as people can become hypertensive at night, either on their own or when they take their blood pressure medications at night, uh, or in, you know, in the setting certainly of low systemic blood pressure chronically that could then even go lower at night. Uh, and then finally for fluctuations, we also think of people who take uh, medications like sildenafil that can cause systemic blood pressure to lower acutely uh, and then decrease perfusion to the optic nerve. And finally, sleep apnea has been postulated to be associated with risk for ischemic optic nerve injury. And then uh, thinking about uh, the risk for these specific factors, the ischemic optic neuropathy decompression trial demonstrated that 60% of patients with a non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy had at least one vasculopathic risk factor, 47% having hypertension, 24 having diabetes. And the same trial demonstrated that approximately 15% of these patients then would develop um, uh, ischemic optic nerve injury in the fellow eye, the initially unaffected eye within five years, which is a big deal if you've already lost vision in one eye. Um, and this could be even uh, a greater risk for younger patients um, in some other studies. And so it is important to think about the risk factors that each individual patient has and how these can be modulated. However, the ischemic injury doesn't seem to recur as often in the affected eye. Um, because it's felt that if it, it, if it truly isn't kind of an anatomic uh, phenomenon, that once some of the nerve fibers are lost, there's more space. And so even if uh, subsequent swelling does occur, uh, there's less risk of, of compression from that swelling and, and uh, additional injury. So the natural, natural course of AION in general, uh, it's felt that uh, the vision worsens progressively uh, initially and then remains stable. Some studies have shown recovery, uh, you know, over time, even up to three lines. Um, but 
in general, this isn't felt to be the case. A recent study out of Singapore uh, showing these uh, initial visual field deficits demonstrated that about 77% of the patients you had no change at six months after their initial presentation in their visual field. 15% uh, did show some small improvement and then actually 7.5% worsened. Um, but overall, people generally remain stable and it's difficult to get that vision back. But what are the types of treatments that have been studied to try and do so? Well, um, there's a nice review by Atkin that came out in 2010 kind of chronicling a lot of these trials and some of the early trials are listed here, so the 60s through the 90s. And they really focused a lot on anticoagulation, thinking, you know, it's a blood flow issue. Um, but these didn't show dramatic benefit. There were some early trials, um, case controlled studies looking at steroids, thinking that the swelling component is contributing to some of the nerve loss given the tight uh, environment of the optic nerve, so uh, that a steroid could reduce some of the swelling. And, and these early data were promising in that regard. Uh, and so some of the later studies looked at that question, but also some of the treatments that were we think about more often now, like bromonidine. And so to highlight some of these, the <coughs> optic nerve decompression trial that I mentioned earlier didn't show any uh, benefit of optic nerve de decompression in the setting of the edema, but some of the more recent steroid trials have shown some uh, visual improvement in patients treated with oral, high-dose oral steroids. Um, bromonidine, which we uh, occasionally will put patients on for neuroprotection in this uh, setting, did not really show any benefit, though um, these trials were difficult to enroll in because of the uh, time frames for enrollment, and um, but they did show either no benefit or possibly a worsening in visual uh, outcomes. And this is really surprising given um, what we've seen in animals for bromonidine. And I was interested in this question because we do frequently uh, suggest to patients that they go on bromonidine in the affected eye and sometimes even in the unaffected eye as a preventative measure. And in animals, um, just in the setting of experimental glaucoma in monkeys, administration of bromonidine has shown increased ret retinal ganglion cell survival. And then in the specific setting of ischemic injury to the optic nerve, um, bromonidine does uh, demonstrate um, a re reduction in the retinal ganglion cell loss in response to this injury. So you can see uh, in A, this is an untreated segment with more cell loss here in the ganglion cells than in B or in C, which is the healthy control. And so I think that there are questions about their model for ischemic optic neuropathy. They locally inject rose bengal into the vasculature, and I don't know how, it, certainly that would cause a vascular insult, and, um, but I think if anything, it might be more severe than what we sometimes see in humans. But, um, so there are questions going forward, but I think that um, the animal studies are certainly promising, and there may be more to this if we can design a trial that isn't quite as problematic for enrollment uh, and quantification of, of results for bromonidine. But nonetheless, moving on to an important question of secondary prevention now um, and what's actually been studied for this, uh, because as I mentioned, 15 to 35 percent of patients might experience this ischemic injury in the second eye after they've already uh, had some catastrophic vision loss in one eye. And of course, we would want to prevent that. And what the, the major studies really have looked at aspirin. <coughs> and They've all been retrospective. Uh, one showed a statistically significant benefit to aspirin, but all of them sh did show some trend towards statistical significance and putting your patient on aspirin uh, to prevent this injury in the second eye. But I think that you have to kind of consider what type of patient you're looking at. For example, if you're looking at someone who um, is having an ischemic injury from like a low flow system. They have low blood pressure, they're on sildenafil, they're taking their blood pressure medications at night. 
Aspirin may not have as much of an effect as if they have coronary artery disease and they're not getting uh, good perfusion because uh, of that setting. So in that setting, I would expect more benefit from aspirin. So I think you kind of have to uh, understand the physics of the system with regard to your patient. So moving on now to the other entity that this patient uh, was felt to have, posner schlafman syndrome, it's a form of secondary open angle glaucoma <coughs> first described in 1948, uh, generally occurring in people aged 20 to 50 years old. And this is from one of the uh, seminal papers, and I thought it was really interesting as some of these criteria have changed over the years. But in general, the features of this condition, it's a unilateral condition characterized by recurrent episodes of a mi very mild non-granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis. The patient will experience mild discomfort, halo, slight blurring of vision, similar to what our patient described. Um, the slit lamp findings are characterized by corneal edema, elevated intraocular pressure, which is usually out of proportion to the inflammation that you see. So very mild inflammation, but very high intraocular pressures. Open angles on gonioscopy, uh, fine KT, uh, minimal inflammation, uh, and sometimes medriasis in the affected eye. Uh, attacks can last for a few hours or they can last for a few weeks and uh, it's, you can't know from the initial presentation which it will be. And then um, this criteria is interesting that the patient will have normal visual fields and optic discs uh, in this condition and, and by and large this is true but um, there's some more recent data that bring this into question. And then in between attacks, Initially, it was felt that the IOP was always going to be normal and that um, provocative test, by which I think they mean visual fields, um, would be normal. So this is kind of our starting point and then trying to differentiate this condition from other uh, glaucomatous reasons for having high pressure. These are some of the things that really distinguish Poshner schlafman as I mentioned, the very mild anterior inflammation that's out of proportion with the high IOP, so a u true uveitic glaucoma, either um, um, uh, infectious or non-infectious, usually has a little bit more inflammation, um, though a herpetic infection can have similar appearing KT. Uh, and then this condition never develops posterior sinusitis, so in the uveitic and herpetic glaucomas, you usually see some um, posterior sinusitis development. And then um, this is an interesting phenomenon in that we're now seeing in Posner Schlossman patients that they do develop some, s some form of iris atrophy, which was always felt to be more indicative of the Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis or even a herpetic sequelae. But um, these patients can develop some, some types of atrophy, <laughs> which can be make it a little bit more difficult to, to distinguish between these types of glaucoma. Um, but certainly in Fuchs, we see these fine abnormal angle vessels on gonioscopy, which is very characteristic for that condition, so could help to distinguish these two uh, entities. So in thinking about the treatment for Posner's last men, we treat uh, the pressure and the inflammation. So usually we use topical corticosteroids as well as a glaucoma uh, agent. And um, usually that's Predforte and then carbonic anhydrase inhibitors have been found to be very e efficacious. And usually because these people present with such high pressures initially, they usually are placed on oral diamox and then possibly a topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitor or a beta blocker. Uh, the prostaglandins, that they usually do lower pressure a little bit um, better in general. However, they have been associated with recurrence of herpetic uveitis. And so if that's on your differential, which usually it would be in, in these patients, it would probably not be a good idea to put these patients on a prostaglandin. And just in general uh, uveitis treatment, there is a question as to whether prostaglandins can just potentiate uh, other forms of uveitis. And so for that reason, uh, it's not generally, those, that class is not generally used as much. So in the absence of underlying glaucoma damage, usually these patients are not treated for glaucoma in the intermediate um, time points between attacks, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment. So 
uh, our role as clinicians is to surveil the patients periodically for any signs of damage or recurrence of attacks, though usually they're fairly symptomatic when they do have an attack. And in general, it's a medically managed condition. Surgery is rare. However, um, a recent series by Jap and colleagues found that 26% um, roughly of patients studied had glaucomatous optic nerve damage. So whether that was as a result of the acute attacks or whether they were having ongoing um, glaucoma in that population uh, is a little bit unclear. But uh, initially when this condition was described, it was felt to be benign actually. That's what how it's listed in the literature. It's a benign secondary glaucoma condition. So uh, in addition, there uh, has been an association with primary open angle glaucoma and um, up to 45% of patients uh, have been described uh, with some form of primary open angle uh, findings. So that means between attacks, they're having evidence <coughs> of glaucoma. And uh, this study by JAP that looked at patients with glaucomatous changes, you can see they had stable visual field changes, um, which again, were not postulated to be part of the syndrome initially, and that this required surgical intervention uh, Looking at the patients who developed glaucoma, I thought this was interesting. Really, the only uh, parameter of the parameters that they looked at, they only looked at four things. But of the things that they looked at, the most indicative uh, risk factor was duration of disease. So it just um, you, it makes you wonder if you if duration uh, in and of itself is a factor, but the number of attacks is not the factor. Is it the length of attack? Is it that they're having IOP spikes in between attacks that are not being properly treated because of poor surveillance, et cetera. So I think there's a lot we still need to understand about this disease process and the risk for our patients and how we should be treating them. And part of this points, uh, part of this is due to the fact that we're not quite sure why this condition develops and there's been so many um, theories ranging from an autonomic defect to an allergic process to an autoimmune versus an infectious process. Um, one patient in 1986 had a TRAB done and the, they looked at this pathology and noticed mononuclear cells in the trabecular um, inner spaces, um, but the reason for those cells being there was unclear. Another group actually went so far as to look at H. pylori, um, not in the eye, but um, they looked at it in the serum and they were able to show an association with H. pylori uh, antibodies and Costner Schlafman syndrome, though they weren't, you know, further able to describe what the mechanism might be, perhaps autoimmune, you know, um, mimicry uh, somehow to the H. pylori uh, antigens, but, but that's somewhat unclear. I think the most credible data really is on CMV. And so this was first postulated in 1987 when a group looked at patients with um, Costner Schlafman syndrome and found about 70% of them demonstrated local synthesis of CMV antibodies. And then this prompted a larger study um, in, in a cohort of 105 of these patients with anterior uveitis and elevated intraocular pressure, 24 were positive for CMV DNA in their aqueous by PCR. And of these, 18 had Costner Schlafman syndrome, and then 11 of the 18 were positive um, by reverse transcriptase um, PCR. So there was active viral replication. So that's suggestive, but I th the data that I liked the most was that they then took these patients who were positive for CMV, CMV in their aqueous and were felt to have a phenotype consistent with Costner Schlafman syndrome and they treated them with antivirals. And it's a fairly small study and they, they used a lot of different treatment modalities, but essentially they showed that there was a decrease in the attack frequency, the degree of inflammation, and the degree of IOP spikes. So I thought that was fairly interesting. And this was just, you know, only on the, the antiviral treatment. They didn't use any other forms of treatment that we normally would for Costner Schlafman. And this was kind of a chronic treatment as a preventative measure. So, but it didn't reduce it to, to zero. So either their treatment just isn't completely efficacious or there's something else going on. So for our patient, the treatment and clinical course, 
Um, we chose to treat with oral high-dose steroids. Uh, in the setting of AION and the studies that have shown some benefit for AION, and then because Posner Schlossman is generally treated with some form of steroids, though normally topical, but we kind of killed two birds with one stone. She wasn't placed on topical treatments. She was just placed on an oral high-dose taper. Um, the pressure was controlled with alpha-GAN for two weeks. This was then discontinued and remained normal. Uh, her Humphrey visual field uh, at four months out then demonstrated some resolution of this superior nasal defect. Uh, her best corrected visual acuity was improved to 2020 bilaterally where it had been 2025 uh, best corrected in that right eye. The optic nerve appearance did appear fairly normal with a small cup, though she did have a stable ATD, which was 0.3 log initially. Uh, and the patient has since remained asymptomatic and just undergone normal surveillance. So I think um, in light <coughs> of the data presented, this patient fear had a fairly good outcome. She had a fairly mild presentation of AION, but um, are there other things we should have done or should be looking for going forward? And because this patient has low blood pressure, we postulated that that was really the um, risk factor that she had for developing this uh, AION condition. So she had a low flow system systemically and then a, a transiently high intraocular pressure and then the combination decreased perfusion to her optic nerve. And so if that is correct, she is at risk for this occurring again because she continues to have low systemic blood pressure. And so um, she probably will need to be surveilled um, very carefully. She's a very reliable patient. I think she will report any symptoms um, and, and you can get her on treatment you know, on her own at home right when she begins to have symptoms. But then you know, should we treat her prophylactically with an antiviral just to try and reduce IOP spikes, thinking that any IOP spike could result in AION in her? So I think that's a question going forward, not just for this patient, but I think of other applications of this where you essentially have a lower flow um, system with a transiently high interocular pressure. And as I've discussed through the talk, the physics really are that the perfusion of the optic disc is directly proportional to the mean arterial pressure and inversely proportional to the intraocular pressure. And that the small cup to disc in certain patients then um, will crowd the nerve fibers and make them susceptible to even more damage uh, from subsequent swelling than, than just the initial ischemic insult. So other scenarios where this is then described uh, include after cataract extraction with transient IOP spike and uh, in the setting of acute angle closure glaucoma. So I think it's something just to consider in any patient you see with a small cup to disc to just quickly assess um, what their perfusion risk factors might be to their optic nerve and how those might be modulated. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> yes, take your hand. They did, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they used patients with um, Poshner Schlossman that weren't treated with any antivirals. And so they, they, compared, um, they compared to the control group, but I felt like the most helpful data, though it wasn't the most scientific, was to compare to the previous spikes of that same patient. So they did both. I was just hoping to be the silver standard, really. Yes. Yeah. And so they that chart had the different field defects, and then the fact that all of those patients then underwent a surgical management, which usually isn't thought of in Posner-Schlossman.
account because they were having um, permanent vision loss based on field. And then I just have something really quickly. Uh, let's see. How do I find it? Uh, I just wanted to talk really quickly about an opportunity I had to go to the Navajo reservation. Jim and I went down and um, is it, what time is it? I don't have any other time. Oh, we have a little bit of time. So um, Jim and I had the opportunity to go down with the Marin Outreach Team to the Navajo Reservation. And uh, the purpose of the trip was to do screenings to understand what the population really needed. A lot of these patients are limited even to going to doctors locally, let alone coming up here. So when we see patients up here, we see a very select subset of severe pathology, but we don't know because you know they've they they're so severe they have to be transferred up here. But we don't know what this population needs. We um, uh, could be more active in this community if we had a better sense of what they needed. So that was the purpose of this trip, and it was uh, sponsored by the Moranai Center and the David Kelby Johnson Hope Fund, which is a very generous donor to the Moranai Center uh, and that our outreach program. So uh, we went to two locations uh, down in the Four Corners. We went to Montezuma Creek and Monument Valley, and we worked with the local clinics there, which were very helpful in getting the word out to all of the people in the communities that we would be coming so that uh, we had a, lot, a very good turnout. We saw almost 500 people in the two days that we were down there. And um, so I'll just go through kind of how we organized the clinics, what types of things we were seeing, et cetera. We did partner with the Hope Alliance, and so this is their group here, which is a volunteer group uh, who is very helpful in kind of uh, accomplishing the logistics of flow and, and things like that. So in general, we saw 432 patients, 314 were adults, 118 were children, and the numbered gamma, and this is what Jim and I um, this is the actual indirect anterior segment and posterior segment exam, um, but the rest were examined in terms of vision, and I'll go into that vision and refraction and things. And so the age range was three to 95 years, so it was just all comers. And you can see that we were in gymnasiums of, of many sorts, and, and people were just uh, waiting for quite a long time to have their eyes examined. So there is quite a, quite a need. We started off uh, with stations to try and uh, have people flow through. We started with vision, pupils, movements, and confrontational visual field. And then the Hope Alliance helped us move to the autorefraction where um, you can see they had these portable autorefractors that then patients could move to a station where we had donated glasses and they just had these suitcases of all these donated glasses. Uh, and then based on the auto refraction values, they would try out different pairs that, that matched and the patient could decide what they liked best. And then I didn't have a picture of this actually being done, but then there was a pressure and dilation station before the patients would then come for the uh, examination. And so this is where patients would kind of break off if they didn't have time to wait. Uh, we encouraged everyone to get an examination, but uh, some patients, you know, didn't have time to wait, and so they would just leave after getting the glasses. So uh, after dilation, we would um, uh, do their examination. And this was quite an undertaking. There was a lot of translation. There were a lot of children but it was very exciting and very fun and the people were just so welcoming and um, thankful that it was pretty humbling. Uh, so the adult team, uh, th this is kind of a list of um, some of the most common things that we saw, certainly cataracts. And so this, uh, the percentages uh, are either of the total, the total patients refracted or of the total patients examined, depending on which is more appropriate. So for cataracts, obviously, we needed to examine them. So almost 60% of the patients we saw had cataracts, and um, about 19% of those had advanced stage, which um, 
by indirect examination, Gemini said was about three plus and on. Um, and um, what I found was really interesting is there were a lot of hyperopic adults, um, many more than I was used to seeing. Um, certainly some myopic uh, adults, but not, not actually as much. And we did see some pathologic myopia, um, mostly indicated by the actual degree of myopia. I didn't see a lot of um, other signs of pathologic myopia. Um, but uh, we saw a good amount of diabetic retinopathy, not quite as much was severe, um, and not quite as much, I mean, 31% of examined, based on the patients that we see up here from the Four Corners region, I expected at like 100%, <laughs> but that wasn't the case. Um, we did see a good amount of uh, really interesting astigmatism. Um, greater than two diopters uh, was 19% of the adult population. The range was about two to seven diopters. And really interestingly, even in the, the very, um, old, this was still with the rule. So it was a, an interesting type of astigmatism. We saw some macular degeneration, a small percentage of, of wet changes, a lot of pterygia, some hypertensive changes. Some people did ha have access and had had cataract surgery. Um, we did see a good amount of elevated cup to disc uh, and um, some increased interocular pressures even up to the 60s and beyond. And uh, we saw s a more amblyopia than I, than I would have expected, or this is presumed amblyopia based on anisometropia, no history of trauma, kind of things like that. And um, a good amount of, you know, chronic retinal detachment. Uh, that's, I guess maybe I should have expected that, but didn't expect quite as much of that. And so for the hyperopia, <coughs> I just looked that up because I just thought maybe I just don't see that much hyperopia. But in fact, the NEI says that there's only about 5 to 10% of Americans that are hyperopic. So to have 42% of hyperopic patients was really um, unusual. And then in terms of the astigmatism, I looked and there really isn't that much uh, investigation of this in the ophthalmic literature, but the optometric literature has described this mostly in the a pediatric population. And so, um, so this is commonly seen, this high with the rule, uh, as regular astigmatism is seen very commonly in the pediatric population. And the most that's been described in the adults is that it persists with advancing age. So the etiology and whether it's <coughs> a form of keratoconus or something else is not really understood. Um, so in terms of children, there were 118 children that were seen, and this means that their vision was tested and they underwent autorefraction. Um, and what we saw in these children, uh, we saw quite a bit of myopia um, as compared to hyperopia, which is a little bit different than what we um, normally would see here. We did see a fair amount of pathologic myopia, some very high values there. And then again, this interesting astigmatism. Uh, fairly um, few uh, deviations. We did see a, a little bit of esotropia and, and some amblyopia and anisometropia. Um, we even saw pterygium. And this was a very interesting patient. I think I have a picture coming up of this optic distrusion. <laughs> Because Jim saw the patient, and then he said, Leah, <laughs> will you look at this patient? It doesn't look very good. So I looked, and I thought, oh, we need a B-scan. And then Julie Crandall was like, oh, well, we have a B-scan. <laughs> so it was very, we had no idea we had a B-scan, but it turned out to be very useful <laughs> because then we were able to examine this child and determine that he had optic distrusion bilaterally and not, he did not need an urgent MRI. So um, in terms of unique adult findings, we saw some very interesting things in native lens dislocation, which was related to trauma. Saw some traumatic cataracts, optic nerve pallor. Um, the retinal detachments uh, mostly were related to trauma, but there was one that certainly had some NV, and that was probably why they ended up detaching. 
um, but hard to tell when you see it kind of end stage. You saw this interesting anterior perforation that had kind of granulated over and um, with a, you know, the eye was no longer open, so it was uh, a healed scleral perforation um, that the patient had had since birth. <laughs> Uh, and we, Jim actually saw retinoschisis, which was really interesting. And then we saw what we felt to be an endophthalmitis after cataract surgery. So not very many of the patients had had cataract surgery, but the ones that had, had some interesting lens placement and <laughs> iris configurations. <laughs> and, um, and this particular patient we felt had um, some pretty severe findings. Uh, and we referred this patient and this patient to a local um, optometrist who could then hook them up with a proper ophthalmologist in the area because this patient we felt like had something that looked like CIN. Um, then we saw some, you know, a fair amount of NLP vision, traumatic injuries to the seventh nerve, and just human myelinated nerve fiber layer. So I think that all in all, we saw some very interesting things. It were, there were some busy days afterwards. We went back, we all stayed in the same house. <laughs> and um, we had a great time seeing, we occasionally on the drive to and from the locations, we did catch some of the scenery, which was beautiful and, and kind of rainy when we were there. But it was a good opportunity and I think it showed that um, the peop there's gonna be good turnout, um, there's a lot of good coordination with the, the local clinics and things to get people to come to these screenings, but I think that the uh, ideal would be to have more targeted screenings now that we see what people are presenting with and have certain groups go down. There was a huge need for pediatric. There were more pediatric patients than we could see because we needed parental consent for dilation and things, and so I think that we can have a coordinated effort in that regard. Um, as well as some of the other subspecialties, certainly I think glaucoma and retina would be two that would be really well received down there. And um, cataracts, although not as medically urgent, I think um, would really help benefit some of these um, patients' uh, quality of life and things. So there's a great need. The patients are really welcoming and, help and uh, w um, good to work with. Um, there's a great infrastructure for getting the patients into uh, our clinics when we go down there and set them up and so I think um, it, it would be a great opportunity going forward for resident involvement and things like that certainly. Any questions about that trip? Thank you.